Lord for the Thursday after Ash Wednesday, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So unlikely, yet complete reality. Oh, how could they? Their good and perfect Creator, who had displayed nothing but pure love for them, made it all for them, crowned them. But oh, what success he had. Their lying enemy, tempting them, causing them to doubt, then despise, seeing God as holding out on them, and leading them to choose themselves over him. Like a predator hunting its prey, Satan swiftly and strongly stalked and cornered and devoured Adam and Eve. Through one act of disobedience. That's how St. Paul recounts not only the tragedy, but its catastrophic significance. Death came to all men. Ever since that first disobedience, sin has been mankind's reality and Satan has been the sinner's owner. Oh, it's not even a challenge for our enemy any longer. Our sinfulness is shown in the natural way we view God and his commands. Our sin is evident in how we act out our hearts. God says it, and his word seems old-fashioned, undesirable, not relevant, even harmful to sinners. Satan walks the noose of temptation right around our necks, and we think it's great. Disobedience seems far preferable, and we choose it. Then he chokes us with it. Hearing God's word today, we must be reminded of the sincerity and formidability of Satan. He is stronger and craftier than us. We minimize the battle and the consequences to our great peril. They are fierce and eternal. Through sin and impenitence, Satan owns sinners forever. The end. But it isn't. Oh, how could he? Ruined, again, ruined. That's the status of God's dear creation. Undeserving, even rebellious. We've already seen the hearts and actions of man. Death. That's the due consequence for it. So why would he do it? Why should he do it? What would prompt him to put himself through it? Against the real enemy, the powerful foe, the one who has already overcome man, yet who lies entirely beneath him, outside of pure love, none of it makes a bit of sense. Yet he does it, and oh, what success he had. Driven by the Spirit, sent forth by the Father's promise and plan, sing, my tongue, the glorious battle, so genuine was the temptation, so fierce was the warfare, so exhausting was the drain, and yet he does it. Through one act of obedience. And with that, St. Paul recounts not only the victory, but its most blessed significance. Although he perfectly resisted all temptation and was without sin in every way, he drank the cup of God's wrath in our place completely so that sinners might be declared not guilty in him, so that the dead might have new life in him, so that the cup of his grace may never run empty. And this is the cup which he has shared with you. This is the cup from which he has poured truly cleansing water over your life in holy baptism. This is the cup which he gives you to drink in communion with him, now, because Christ was laid lifeless in the ground and rose again, we who are in him will die his death and live his life. No longer does Satan own you. Your Jesus already won and has given his victory to you, that you might daily fight and finally overcome with him in this great fight now and forever. So unlikely, yet a complete reality. Let us pray. O God, because one man's sin brought sin and death and condemnation to all men, death reigned. 
but Jesus Christ came to crush our enemy for us and reign supreme. By his victory over sin, death, and devil, daily grant to us the forgiveness of all sin, and restore true and eternal life to us who gave it up long ago. Amen.